think to some extent, the stories that I've most enjoyed are the ones that like, I really learned something new. Like there's a real experience element to it. Um, that's kind of the, one of the benefits of being a journalist is to experience and to learn yourself. And then you have to find a way to like transcribe that to someone else and like help someone else understand what you experience. This is Andrew Vance, and you're listening to Choose the Hard Way, where I explore the obstacles people overcome to do great things with peak performers from sports, business, tech, the arts, the military, and other disciplines. We've recently reached 100 five-star reviews on iTunes, and I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who listens to Choose the Hard Way and to everyone who's taken a moment to go and hit the stars in the iTunes store. It makes a huge difference, helps more people to discover the show, helps us to surface higher in search, and I really appreciate everybody who's taken a moment to do that. If you've got feedback, questions, a guest suggestion, or want to be in touch, you can always reach me at choosethehardway at gmail.com. My guest on this episode is Tom Taylor. Tom is one of the brightest, humblest, and most insightful minds covering the intersection of science, technology, and sports for outlets including Sports Illustrated and Sport Techie. Tom has a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Stanford University and an MS in journalism from Columbia University. Growing up, Tom dreamed of becoming an astronaut before discovering a passion for storytelling that took his life and career in a new direction. Through journalism, Tom has written about topics as varied as disability and data privacy, nutrition and degenerative brain disease, the future of the NFL combine, equality and entrepreneurship, genetics, and the Vietnam War. Now, it was a real treat to get to have this conversation shortly before Tom moved from the San Francisco Bay Area to Spain for the next chapter in his life and career. To learn more about Tom, read some of his favorite stories or contact him, please go to dailytomtaylor.com and you can find that link in the show notes. I decided, like, I've always wanted to ride from LA to, uh, no, from San Francisco to LA. Like that's always been like something I've wanted to do. Um, because and because you, you have a death wish, is that why? Just because it like, it seems close enough that it's doable, right? Yeah. In like without too much planning, but like, and the, the coastal road, you know, is beautiful. Um, so it's not, it's not like I'm just riding through like some industrial wasteland. <laughs> um, you know, and I've ridden 200 miles through Kansas and that's obviously a, a very different experience to uh, ride along the coastal road in San Francisco, uh, like in California. But um, I've kind of always wanted to do that. And I don't, I'm totally not trained enough this year because I injured myself pretty badly back in February. Um, and uh, I have to leave the country soon. <laughs> so I was like, maybe I should try and do it. Um, so uh, I guess last week, at the beginning of last week, I rode from Ocean Beach to Carmel the first day. Um, and then the second day I rode from Carmel to Santa Maria, which is about total, like two thirds of the way. It's about 300 miles total. You add those two together. And then, um, about, about like 30, 40 miles out of Santa Maria, my, uh, my right ankle started to really hurt. <laughs> oh, man. So I, uh, I just kind of like limped in and, uh, I realized that it was, it got kind of got swollen. And I was like, yeah, I probably shouldn't ride the next day. So, um, but it's so weird because it got swollen and I strapped it up and I iced it and all of the swelling has kind of gone away. Um, and I just went to the doctor kind of last week when I got back here just to, just to check on it, just double check. And immediately they're like, okay, we've got to take an x-ray. We've got to take an MRI. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> um, and now they're kind of, they haven't really told me what the results of the MRI are. So how dramatic. And I have to go, they won't, right. No, they won't like, like, well, so they kind of did tell me the results in some way in that, like I've been dealing with my urgent care who hasn't been very communicative with like my primary care doctor and the urgent care nurse called me up and told me it was serious, but wouldn't tell me what they're treating me for. 
<laughs> so I'm like, well, what what can I do? Like, and they were like, just go by pain. If it's too painful, go to the ER. And either I have a pain, high pain tolerance, or I'm just not in pain. But it just doesn't like it feels a little odd, but it doesn't really like I'm not like staying awake at night in pain. So it's a flesh wound. It's a mere flesh wound. You're operable. Right. Yeah. Like, you're like you got I'm the like, wrong guy if you want to talk about whether this hurts. Right. Like what right. do you what do you mean? Like what kind of pain? <laughs> I should have told them that. So earlier this year, back in February, I I crashed in a crit and I uh, broke my hip, and I drove home because I didn't think it was that bad. <laughs> so like I should have told them that I'm dumb enough that I will break a bone and like like not and ignore it for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you so you did make it to L.A. though, or what? Oh, well, so I got to Santa Maria and I wanted to see some people in LA just to say goodbye as well. So I, my, my plan was always to, to travel super light. So I, would, I just stayed in hotels. So I had to like, I didn't have to carry like a tent or a sleeping bag or anything like that. Um, and I figured the easiest would be to just ride down to LA and rent a car and then drive home. Um, so instead of renting a car in LA, I rented a car in Santa Maria and then just drove, drove down for the day and, and then drove back after your ankle blew up or your Achilles or whatever you, you did the entire ride that day or did you bail at some point and like go get a car? I, I, so my plan was to do it in three days. So like one day from ocean beach to Carmel, one day from Carmel to Santa Maria and the last day from Santa Maria down to LA. Yeah. So I, ba- I bailed the morning of the, uh, the third day. Cause I woke up and I was like, I kind of feel okay. And I looked at my ankle and it's like swollen and weirdly red. And I'm like, yeah, I probably shouldn't do that. So you didn't, <laughs> you didn't even get on the bike that day then? No, it was. And, and I, I, I walked a little bit to go and get a rental car and it was actually, it was pretty painful walking. So you coward. Yeah, I know. I'm a wuss. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But before we get into other stuff, you mentioned that, that, that hip break. <laughs> and you know i think that the big mistake there was probably ever deciding that the next step in your athletic career was to jump into crit racing but like what went down in that race um and what's was, what's a crit for anyone who's listening who might not know what a crit is right so it's like it's an intense like short circuit uh bike race where instead of a set number of laps, it's, it's normally like a set amount of time. And you just go around that as many laps as you can in that, in that period of time. But it's, there's a lot of people in a very small space. Um, and like in a lot of cycling, you get great benefit from being really close together. And like, if you tuck in behind someone like cycling is a sport where like, aerodynamics and being able to you know sit in someone's wake like makes such a difference um so in crit racing it's not just like everyone trying to go around as fast as possible it's everyone trying to go around as fast as possible while no social distancing i mean this was before like the pandemic but like everyone wants to be like as close as possible the whole time sweating Um, sweating on each other Sweating on each other and literally you know. like the sweat's flying. I was just telling somebody last night, they were like, Oh, they mentioned somebody. I was like, Oh yeah, I know that guy. Like he's actually sweat on me before. Like I remember drafting <laughs> him and his sweat was like flying back and coating me on a, in a training race. Right. Yeah. It's like yeah. when you get like that droplet of whatever and you're like, hopefully that's from their water bottle. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, and, and because it's like such a short, uh, like circuit, you know, normally pretty, pretty steep, like pretty, um, acute, like tight turns, um, which make it obviously even more intense when there's a lot of people trying to get around like a narrow corner all at once. Um, and, uh, I'd done a couple of, there's like a training, I'm I'm sure there are training series across the U S for crit racing, but like there was a training series nearby and I'd done a couple there and that was on a much more benign, I guess circuit was more like really a square so like there were sharp corners but it wasn't like crazy intense um and it was super fun because like in the training thing i kind of went into it like playing around a little bit like my fitness is my fitness 
at, at least for like a Cat 5, which is kind of, although they've, I guess they've, I don't know whether they changed the name of Cat 5, but they changed how they do it. That's like the category of rider in like the US cycling kind of thing. And Cat 5 is like the, the lowest, the, the novice. Um, like I've ridden a lot. So I was kind of like, had pretty good fitness for someone who was in, in that category um, as a racer. Just enough, it, to, just enough to break your hip. Well, <laughs> but like in the training things, it was really fun because yeah. I could just like see, I could like break people. Yeah. It was kind of fun. You, you, you see someone and you go and you just want to see where they'll hang on to you. And like, like I didn't mind if I lost. I was just kind of interested to see what the dynamics, like the social dynamics of like of crit racing was be like. And it was just interesting to see, you know, the people that, will go for those breaks the people that will try and chase something down and anyway yeah you just wanted to impose your will right and so so like it was it was very interesting having gone from like doing a lot of these like longer rides it was very interesting trying crit racing and so i signed up for a crit race and you could win a pie so i mean that was a that was a pretty good thing you know good good prize there um and uh that was a really really tight hairpin <laughs> and i like i was in the i was in the younger i was racing in like the younger category than kind of like what i could race in the young stallions um, right yeah exactly right and uh um they were pretty fast <laughs> and i was like i was definitely not on the front of the pack uh but i was in a little group that was like hanging behind them and went round this hairpin just way too tight uh, and I, well, I mean, didn't necessarily go around it too tight, but, um, started pedaling too quickly mm. while my bike was still significantly lent over. Um, and then what happened was my left pedal just like slammed into the ground. Um, and I was like, like, I've had that a little bit where you like touch it and you notice it, but this one, it just like, it just threw me off the bike. Yeah. That's usually your so, your back wheel goes out from under you, kicks sideways, and then yeah, you usually have a very bad wreck when that happens. And yeah, you did. I remember, you did. Yeah, yeah, I remember doing like a full like somersault and cracked my broke my helmet, which was was always interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, my theory on helmets is you spend a lot of money for this really expensive helmet that will break like once, but like you're totally happy that you spent three hundred dollars on a helmet when it breaks and you don't have a concussion <laughs> it happens in bike racing so you ended up breaking your hip you drove <laughs> yeah you're like hey i'm gonna drive to the hospital i was well no i i was like so you know i was on the ground and like you know everyone like comes up to you even sometimes when you're not actually badly hurt you kind of feel badly hurt like initially um and you just need a moment and it kind of felt like that and then i was just like yeah i'm actually i must have like sprained my hip really badly <laughs> Right. Um, and I was luckily I was right next to the nurses station. So it was like an easy, like limp over to them. And then I sat there for a while and then I was like, well, I know I'm done racing today. I, there was another race I was going to do, but uh, obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, and I still like at this point, I had no thought that I'd broken anything. So, um, I started using my bikes are really good crutches. If you're ever like, injured. <laughs> like it's a great walking crutch. So, um, I kind of started limping with my bike and then someone felt really sorry for me and <laughs> gave me a ride to my car. <laughs> um, and then I kind of got everything into my car, drove home from, this was up in Napa. So it's a, like a hour to two hour drive home, whatever that is. Um, which was <laughs> like, it's really easy to not fall asleep when you're in quite a lot of pain. <laughs> um, so I had no worries about falling asleep while I was riding, driving. Um, and I got home, uh, got my bike into my house, like locked it up in my house, like had a shower, all these things that like I really shouldn't have been doing it, like when I had like an actually broken hip. Um, and then... I was texting a friend and they were like, you need to go to hospital. <laughs> You're like, no, you know what? I just want to do a trampoline session. Then I'll, right. you know what? Then I'll head out. <laughs> I've, been, I've been working on my vaulting. So my, my, um, 
my compromise was I'll go to urgent care. Yeah. Because I was like, I don't think it's that bad. So I went to urgent care and they sent like, basically because I'd broken my helmet, um, they immediately sent me to the ER uh, because um, they, I guess that it, it's in a, cla- a classification where they're like, this is a concussion risk, you know, so you yeah. have to go to like an ER. Um, and, and by the time I got to the ER, more than six hours had gone by. And so they actually determined that they didn't need to like test me for concussion because there's like a six hour window that if you don't yeah. have signs or symptoms of that, so I didn't have to. I didn't have a concussion, which is great. That's a good news. Um, <laughs> and uh, initially, they weren't sure that there was a fracture. Um, it's often the case if you have a very, very like fine fracture that they won't immediately catch it. Um, but they had a few. I guess they were worried because I, I, I really couldn't bear weight on that leg. So they thought it was probably something more severe, and they. They found that there was uh, basically a pretty hairline fracture. Nothing was displaced, um, which was good because ultimately, like I spent a night in the hospital. Um, actually, I spent a couple of nights in the hospital, and they were thinking that they would do an operation, and they determined that because nothing had actually moved, they could basically get away without doing an operation. Um, and they're an inherent risk of having an operation, so it's yeah. kind of good to avoid it if you actually don't need it um and but it's but i still was basically in the same like post-op uh recovery even though i didn't have an operation uh which was basically absolutely no weight bearing on my left uh for two months wow yeah and then but then it healed up and you got back to it then it healed up i mean i still have some like it's amazing. I don't know if you've had any significant leg injuries, but it's amazing how your body just forgets how to use the muscles correctly. Right. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yep. Like you start walking around with your like hand on your butt because you're like, is my glute firing when I walk? <laughs> yeah. No. Totally. Yeah. Um, stuff gets pretty out of whack. Yeah, and I still have a little bit of like, like in the in the sort of like the linear like forward motion. Um, it, a lot of the strength has come back, but some of the side to side motion. So like in cycling, it's, a, it's generally much more linear. You don't really have so much like side to side, although like side to side muscles will help give you control and stability on the bike, um, and like reduce fatigue and stuff like that. But so that's where the kind of deficits are right now. So as you mentioned earlier, you're getting, you're getting ready to leave, but <laughs> like before we get to that, Maybe tell me a little bit about how you ended up in California. Everybody's got a special story. Also, back a long time ago, um, my dad was a pilot, so uh, like an airline pilot. So I guess um, flying and aviation was always something that was kind of in my blood in some way. Um, and when I was a kid, I was that kid that wanted to be an astronaut. Um, <laughs> and uh tell me a little bit more you know, before we go on i'm going to hear a little bit more about, <laughs> like how did that manifest like what what were you doing well my dad because my dad my dad was also like super interested in like uh, the space program and, and, and still is kind of stuff um uh he and because he was a pilot i don't know exactly how but he would sometimes like when you're on when you're a airline pilot um other, especially back then before like 9-11. So this is like when people could actually go up to the cockpit and like chat and like it was a sort of much friendlier atmosphere. Um, you know, if there was, if there were other pilots on the plane, of, you know, they they do the same job. They'd kind of like chat and whatever. And um, he, he got to know uh, someone who flew one of the uh, NASA's, I think they're T-38s. Um, they're kind of like the, uh, I think they use them as chase planes for the, uh, um, for the space shuttle landing. Um, they also use them as like training planes for pilots and, and, uh, and stuff like that. And he, he's like an ex military guy, uh, had worked at NASA for a while and kind of got to know him. Uh, his name was uh, triple nickel or his, his cool sign was triple. Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, and, uh, 
he uh he got us to come and do some like tours of actually uh kennedy space center where were you really where, cool. where were you living then i was living in the uk okay but but because my like because my dad was a pilot like back then it was relatively easy to like come out and visit out here right you know because you know that was before i knew how much airplane tickets cost yeah what you're, you're a kid you like it's like whatever. Well, not, not like, only yeah. am i a kid but yeah. i'm a kid with like standby privileges <laughs> where like ultimately it might be costing you like 50 pounds or like 50 dollars or whatever for a flight you don't always get on but like when you do get on like you end up in like some foreign place <laughs> wow that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah um so yeah we got to know him and i remember going to uh kennedy space center and having like a tour around and there was a shut one of the space shuttles was on the pad and we literally like went climbed like went up in the elevator up in the tower um where the shuttle was sort of like sitting waiting for a launch um like poked our heads inside no way yeah like Whoa. <laughs> that's insane <laughs> yeah um and then a couple of days later uh watched uh from like nearby from the causeway um watched the shuttle take off which was was pretty spectacular so there were there were a few like experiences like that that um like obviously made it really cool <laughs> as a kid and something kind of to aspire to although the tricky thing in the uk is like there are british astronauts but all the british astronauts pretty much have some other connection like uh, like uh, like most of them um you know, their mother is American or their father is American. So they're actually astronauts because they're American, okay. not necessarily because they're British. Um, but it, it kind of seemed like the U S was the place to be. If, if like I was aspiring towards something like that. Um, and after my undergrad in the UK, I was looking to somewhere to study, um, to do a, a graduate degree. And, uh, I was lucky enough to get into Stanford, so which which kind of brought me here. And it, I just quick question: It seems like a lot of people who end up becoming astronauts. It seems like there are a couple of paths. One is like either way, people definitely go super deep in academia. They generally have a PhD and then a lot of postdoc work. But a lot of people also go in through the military. It seems was that something you considered at all? Uh, it wasn't something I considered back then. I did actually like. After, like, much later, I did, I was planning to join the British Army um, uh, until I injured myself and kind of got, um, like, canned from that. But um, uh, that was, uh, yeah, it wasn't something I had initially considered. I think partially also because, I mean, I'm probably actually borderline too tall for a national anyway. I think they're normally, like, a little bit shorter. Um just you know if you're shorter it's easy to fit into a confined space um but in terms of uh flying in like the air force or something um definitely like maybe a little bit tall uh for that sort of thing um and and there are like there are definitely the i wasn't necessarily at that time aspiring to be like the pilot of the chase space shuttle but more the mission specialist which is the the person who's net you know so the uh, academic background, the person that will, you know, do the experiments and that sort of stuff. Right. And outside of your academic work, were you flying? Like, did you, do you have a pilot's license or did you ever I get do, one? I, I do have a pilot's license. It's, it's like expired because it, I haven't used it for a while. Um, but yeah, I did get a pilot's license, um, back. I actually got it in Florida, uh, because there were, this was, I was still in undergrad in the UK. Um, but I got one in Florida because they were like, they do these like short um, training things where you can like rapidly get all the hours and, and get a license that way. Um, and, and flying in Florida, in theory, is a lot more reliable. You don't really have to worry too much about the weather. I mean, obviously, if a hurricane comes through, then you worry about the weather. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, in, like in the UK especially when you're learning to become a pilot, because the first 
the first thing you kind of learn to do is you learn to become like a visual pilot. Right. That you don't necessarily use your instrument. I mean, you use the instruments, but you don't just rely on the instruments to like navigate and fly. So, um, which means that you have to have visibility. So in the UK, like it's rainy and cloudy a lot, and that makes it hard to have um, good visibility. So it's it's often like if you book like two times to fly in the UK, then one of them is probably going to get canceled. <laughs> right. Um, ironically, or, or weirdly, um, in Florida, while I was learning to fly there, the uh, the state basically caught fire. Um, and so, so we were actually, we were actually, uh, evacuated and had like things canceled because there were like raging fire, fire sides. How old were you at the time? Uh, I would have been like, about 20 maybe. Yeah. I remember, I remember there was, there was one day, um, this is kind of when we got evacuated. The, so my brother was also there. So we were both kind of learning to fly, um, and I went up for a flight with an instructor and literally like as we were taxing to take off, um, we got told that they were about to close the, the airport that we were flying from because there was a fire at one end of it. So they rushed us to take off because they're like, we don't want our planes to get like, you know, we can't control what happens to the buildings. Like the fire is just going to come, but we want our planes out of the way. Well, that's nice. So we took off. Yeah, so we took off, and and this was actually this was the day that like you do do some practice with like instrument like using your instruments, even though you're learning to be a visual pirate, um, just because you you can't control if you're suddenly in that situation. Um, so that is often like they'll put you in like a weird situation. Maybe the plane's in like some kind of spin, or it's in a weird um, attitude or something, and you have to use your instruments to like stabilize it. Um, and <laughs> so we went out to sea to kind of do that. And there was so much smoke in the sky that like, I think you're normally supposed to wear some kind of like blinder thing that like restricts your vision a little bit. So you don't have that peripheral vision. I didn't really need to do that because there was a lot of smoke in the sky and you couldn't see the horizon. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then like, and so we did that and then we couldn't go back to the airport because it's closed because there's a massive fire. So instead we flew to Daytona International, which is a pretty big airport. Um, and uh, my instructor took over and, and did like the flying once we kind of got there. But basically, we came in after, you know, like an actual jet plane. We we're in like um, uh, a Cherokee, which is like a tiny, like, you know, single engine, like prop plane. Um, and we come in after like serious, you know, jet planes. And they leave like a really significant uh, turbulence. So you have to be careful about not, you know, literally the turbulence of those will like flip a small plane upside down. Um, so you have to be careful about that. But you also, you know, we can't spend a lot of time waiting, like, like a lot of time landing because they also have another big plane that's coming in right after us. So we came in like as hot as possible, like max speed, <laughs> max speed just above the runway and then what he did was he uh he basically turned the plane like semi sideways to like get max like because obviously you get a lot of drag if you do that <laughs> and just like to slow the plane down we touched down and then immediately pulled off the runway so that was pretty that was pretty epic so you went through this whole experience you went to flight school with your brother yeah were you guys competitive no uh, i mean we were definitely competitive kids. We weren't necessarily competitive then. We were both just trying to get like our licenses, whatever. Yeah. Um, but as like as kids, we were yeah totally competitive. I think that's that's interesting, but not at not at flight school. So did you end up <laughs> did you end up getting instrument rated? No, I didn't. Uh, yeah. So I so <laughs> I ended up I got my pilot's license and I flew. So when were that? That must have been like it was probably two thousand. Um, and I got my pilot's license. I flew a little bit, um, back in the UK, uh, when I was like, so that was like my last year of, um, undergrad. I flew a little bit then. Um, and then I hadn't done a lot of flying, 
And then uh, one, like a lot of things change in my life, but also I think one of the last times I ever flew was September 11th. You flew, you flew on September 11th. I think I flew on September. I, I remember I was, I was either flying or I just had to go to the, uh, the airport for some reason to like, I can't remember. I, but I just, rem- I remember driving back from there and I getting home and I, I'd either just been in the plane or I'd just been around planes. And my dad was at TV uh, at home watching TV. And it was just like this weird, um, disconnection between like, I've just been in a plane and wait, that's happening. Like that's not real. And I like, can think it, 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 it must've happened so soon that, um, it, no one at the airport when, when I left there had, was aware of it. You know, it was only when I got home that like, you know, I didn't even hear it on the radio. It was like, it was that, that soon. So, and then you never flew again. Uh, I think I flew once again. Um, but then, I started, you know, I started like I moved to the U S um, I also like, I took a year out and I went scuba diving a lot that year. Um, so like a few things like came up and by then I just, the, the, di- the tricky thing about all these like really fun hobbies is they cost money and they take time. And so once you add like a new one on top of that, like something kind of gets like squeezed out. Um, and, and with, with flying, you, you then like, it's not like driving a car where once you have your license, like if you don't drive for a couple of years, you're probably pretty rusty, but your license is still valid. Um, with flying, like there's, there's actually like it expires and you have to do some like re like up stuff to, to get it going again. Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) <laughs> yeah no like, and like honestly like that should be the case with cars too right like that, yeah that would you've driven a car for like five years like you probably should like take a lesson or something i can't i can't wait for cars to drive themselves honestly <laughs> I it'll be you, you know as cyclists we know that might be might actually be the safer option yeah i mean i want to hear about more about stanford and what you were doing there but you just casually mentioned that you had this scuba adventure. So it's, <laughs> it sounds like you find new hobbies and you kind of end up going pretty deep, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I ended up like over time, uh, diving. I, I ended up like, I went, I went to this kind of like scuba. It was like this gap year experience to go, um, dive on some reefs in, uh, this was in Borneo. Uh, how, so, did, how did you even get into that? Just like you casually end up in Borneo? <laughs> well, no, that was like that, like, so gap years are mu- a much bigger deal in the UK, I think, than the US. Maybe they're becoming bigger in the US, but um, it's it's pretty standard for people to take a year off before or after um, college in the in the UK. And so totally there are were, a lot of these. Were you already diving at the time though before before that experience? I, I had dived um, a few years before in Australia. Um, I like I'd gotten like a, a basic paddy uh, certificate, so I I knew a little bit about scuba diving, but you know like you get that certificate in like four dives or whatever, and then you do like a couple dives afterwards, and like you know if you've if you've been in a, if you've driven a car six times, you probably don't really know how to drive a car. Yeah. So it, it's you know it's that sort of thing, um, and I definitely I definitely wasn't super at home and comfortable in the water because you haven't done it that many times. Like, you know, you, nothing's, nothing's hopefully gone wrong at that point. Um, and so I knew, I, I knew, I knew I could do it. I just hadn't done it that much. Um, so I got to do this, uh, sort of like three months out in Borneo, basically counting fish, (laughs) like looking at coral reefs and like basically the idea was to survey and to um like record what wildlife you saw there which is definitely it was definitely interesting especially from the point of view of understanding what that ecosystem is like like you know and understanding the roles the different animals play in that and that's that's kind of cool like there are there are these fish that are cleaner fish the other fish will come up to them and then they'll basically eat the sort of algae 
or like parasites that are growing on them. And you get like, you literally kind of get these sort of like gas stations on the reefs where, you know, like they're waiting for like, <laughs> well, the fish are like lined up waiting to be attended by the, uh, the cleaner fish. And then you get another fish that is a, is like a false cleaner fish that looks like the cleaner fish. <laughs> so the other fish will come up to them and then they'll just like take a bite out of them. <laughs> what, did, what did you learn about life from observing these, these fish and creatures? I think I learned like how intricate and how like interwoven it is, I think, which is kind of amazing. Um, and, and how like, honestly the fish were cool, but some of the most interesting things on the reefs were the invertebrates, which could be tiny, tiny little animals. Um, like nudibranchs were are, are definitely a, possibly one of my favorite animals and they're, they're sea slugs, but they come in, you know, a land slug is pretty boring. It's like this gray, like lump. Um, the, the nudibranchs are insane colors uh, and they come in like, they can be tiny, they can be really big and they, they can like have, um, almost like wings or like fronds coming off them. Uh, they can also, they'll, some of them will basically steal the stinging cells from jellyfish. So they'll like eat like other animals that sting and then they take the stinging cells and they kind of incorporate them, them into their own body so that that's now their defense mechanism. And it's just like, I, I know it's just amazing how intricate and interwoven and just like detailed all of that is. <laughs> what did you like about diving and what did you like about flying? Did they, like give you a certain feeling or like what did you enjoy about those hobbies? There's definitely like a similarity. I think the interesting thing about going from flying to scuba diving is in flying, like you fly and you need a plane, right? I mean, I guess unless you parachute or whatever, but in scuba diving, you actually get a very, like once you get relatively comfortable down there, you can have a very good sensation of like, being like neutrally buoyant and, and being able to like fly even though you're underwater. Um, to the, you know, yeah, to the point that like when you, when you breathe in and breathe out, when you're scuba diving, you actually go up and down because it changes your buoyancy. Um, and you're, you're never really supposed to like hold your breath because that can be a risk if you um, ascend or descend too quickly when you're holding your breath. But um, it's amazing how, you can use that very fine control of holding your, of, of, of breathing in to like, you know, you're, you're, you're floating along and there's a slight obstacle and you can like breathe in to go over it. <laughs> you know, like, um, and, and, and you start to like, I think when you start scuba diving, it's a lot more frantic. You definitely see it in people's faces. Um, Cause I also, I also did, I spent some time as a dive master, like actually working at a dive shop, uh, teaching people. And you know, one, when people put the mask on, it kind of squishes their face anyway, but you definitely see like these wide eyes. Um, when people are like, Whoa, like I have this thing in my mouth. I'm underwater. Like what the hell is going on? Um, and then their fins are like, their hands are like doing this and their fins are like frantically. Um, and then you see the people that have done it a long time and it's just, they're just much calmer. And you actually, like in scuba diving, a lot of, like you're, you're, you have a limited amount of air or, or gas that you're breathing. So the more frantic you are, the more you burn that up. So... Like you actually, you can, you can do a lot more if you basically just relax. It's like a force, force you to kind of relax. Um, and I know I, I, I definitely went way deeper in scuba diving than I really had in flying. Um, and I, to the point that I did some nitrox diving, which is, do you know what that is? Or I think you should tell us more about it. <laughs> so like, there's, there's breathing air, which is like the typical kind of like scuba diving. Um, and uh, that's what most people do because um, it's easy to fill the tank with air. Uh, but that essentially limits 
like how deep you can go um, because it's uh, there's the amount of nitrogen. There's about like 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen in air roughly. Um, and as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, the pressure of the nitrogen um, like gets higher because you, you, you have to breathe you have to be the air at a higher pressure just to allow your lungs to like expand against the pressure of the water. Um, and I don't actually know exactly why you get this, but nitrogen at a certain pressure will start to cause narcosis, basically make people drunk. Um, so when you get nitrogen narcosis, you also get the problem of, um, the bends, which is decompression sickness. So like all of that, that high pressure nitrogen, basically it gets, forced into the into the, into your blood as like as a in, in a solution um but as you come back up it's possible that that can basically like a fizzy drink like a soda like fizz out and become bubbles um and that's basically what the bends is these bubbles will like get into your blood and like restrict blood flow and you know can damage your brain and things like that um so the way to the way to avert the bends is to like come up very slowly and they have these like decompression stops where you'll stop at a certain um, uh, depth in the water and wait there for a certain period of time. Um, and when you, if you get into scuba diving, you'll probably start using um, these tables, these dive tables that tell you like, I've been down this amount of time. This is like how much time I have to spend at this period of um, at this height, etc. cetera. Um, and then if you get further, you can actually start using a dive computer which kind of does it for you and actually gives you a much finer control because like if the dive table says, you know, I've been down 10 minutes versus 20 minutes, it's like, well, what if I was down 15 minutes? Like how do I interpolate between that, right? Um, but, uh, but you then also have the, com the problem of how much gas do I have? Because like if I have to stay at this place for like five minutes, well, how much gas is in my tank? <laughs> and I might run out. So, so basically to solve like narcosis and to solve, um, uh, or, or, or to get around, yeah, get around narcosis and get around the bends, you can start introducing different gases to the mixture. So instead of breathing this mostly like nitrogen oxygen combination, you add other things to it. Um, so the two gases they basically add are like, well, one is like, they change the mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. So you can either have um, more nitrogen, less oxygen, or you, either way. Um, and, then the, and then the other one is they can add helium. Um, I never, I've never done heliox, which is like helium and oxygen mixture. Um, but I've done like, uh, like different nitrox mixtures, um, so different amounts of oxygen and nitrogen. And um, you also... You also have a common, the other like thing is that oxygen actually gets toxic at certain depths. So it's not like you can just breathe pure oxygen. Um, so I remember, and, and so you start to also like, instead of having that single cylinder on your back, you'll have like twin sets where you have like two cylinders on your back and then you might have like one hanging off your side and you, you literally start to look like the sort of scuba divers you'll see in like adventure movies and um, and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, I remember one dive going down. Um, it, it wasn't that deep. It was like 35 meters, which is, I mean, it's still relatively deep, but, um, it wasn't like a crazy depth and like hanging out there for a while. Um, and then on the way back up, like looking at, um, my dive computer and it's, it says I have to do like an hour stop at uh at six meters which is like not that far below the surface but um that was what it was telling me uh but luckily i had to add a pure oxygen tank so i switched to the oxygen tank because i did i i totally did not have enough gas in the in the primary tank i was using and you switch to the oxygen tank and like that suddenly hour disappears like 20 minutes which is still a long time just sitting there breathing um but it's I don't know it's it's definitely it's a they call it technical diving or these like gas mixtures and stuff like that it's uh it's a you know it's like any sport that you can you can do it as a much more you know it's like cycling you can you can go out and ride your bike around town or whatever and you can like go and get your bike and start to like 
play around with things and add things and go on longer distances and like you can really like hype it up if you want and, but you need some ability of experience and knowledge to do that did your experiences diving change your relationship to relaxation or anxiety at all because it just like what you were describing around having to learn how to breathe and relax underwater and maneuver is that something you brought with you back out of the water or not i don't know but i definitely so one of the other things i kind of experimented with a little bit while i was scuba diving was um like free diving I was going to um, ask if you did any free diving because it sounds right. sounds right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so I did some free diving. Well, I mean, like mostly, I do have um, some longer fins back home, some actual like free diving fins, um, which are like just just much longer than like diving fins, which are normally a little bit shorter. Um, but uh, I. Uh, it's basically it's basically snorkeling, but you go under and you stay under for a long period of time. Is you know, so you have no you have no gas tank with you. Um, it's it's very interesting because one of the the thing that causes your body to want to breathe isn't the lack of oxygen; it's the amount of carbon dioxide you have. Right, and to some extent, you can train that. Um. And it's, it's, if you go and sort of do some breath hold diving, you'll actually find that the first few dives you do, like on any given like session, it's kind of hard because you actually sort of need to warm up your, your ability to do that. But then after a time, you actually get better and better at it. Um, and a lot of that is down to that relaxation. The more you can relax your body, the less excess oxygen it starts to burn um and i i remember some experiences i've definitely done the thing i don't know whether anyone else has done this maybe this is me but um uh if you get a like a bowl of ice water and hold your breath and put your face in it you can actually like decrease your heart rate like quite significantly by triggering like they call it the diving re reflex or the dolphin reflex or something like that um so it's like, so that's kind of interesting to play around with. But I remember one one day free diving, like on a reef, where I just like I swam down like twenty meters down, and like you swim down and your your blood's pumping because you've just been swimming, right? Um, and so because your everything's going like you, you, immediately, your body's saying like you need to breathe, like we need to get some air in there. But if you Force yourself to relax. And that's what I did. I basically just like forced myself to just like relax. Um, suddenly your heart rate drops massively. And then you're, you're just, you kind of lose that urgency to go back to the surface. And it's a very strange, I understand why people die doing free diving. Like it's a pretty dangerous spot. Um, because you become very calm and you, I remember this day, like almost forgetting that I needed to go breathe. And like, I was, I had a dive computer with me and I was basically going off time. And so once it got to a time, I was like, I, I have to go back to the surface. And it was, it was a little, I definitely, when I got to the surface, I really wanted to breathe, but it's, it's weird how, I know it's weird how, bewitching or beguiling or like just being under there and like because you're when you when you scuba dive you're so noisy you're like so noisy as a scuba diver like the air in the air out all of this stuff going on even your um your regulator even if you're not breathing it's normally there's some bubbles coming out um from the fish's point of view you're like you know they're like what the hell is that thing Whereas when you're, when you're like free diving, you're actually just an animal that's in that space. So they might be scared of you because you're an animal, but they're, you're, you're a much more natural kind of thing from that perspective. I'd say. <clears throat> so how did you go from scuba to the United States? And like, what did you come, <laughs> what did you come here to do? And like, what, what, was uh, it, so what was it like to transition from a year of that into academia? It was 
a little weird. Um, I remember when I first came here, well, one, it was weird because the, the UK academic system versus the American academic system is significantly different. Um, I'd never done a midterm in my life. Like throughout all of my undergrad, I never had homework. Um, and then I came to the U S and suddenly like I have to do homework and there's a midterm. Um, and also like the grading scale was totally off because so my, my, the exams in my undergrad, like no one got hundred percent. Like they were not made for people to get hundred percent. Like you, there wasn't enough time given and they were too hard. Like that was, that was, that was given. So if you got above 80%, that was an A. Um, and so <laughs> I remember, I remember coming to the U S and like the first like problem set that I did, I think I got like 85%. And there's me thinking like, sweet, you know, just came here, like had it took a year off and I got 85%. And I like, look over at other people and they've got like 105%. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> How is that even possible? Um, so yeah, I realized I needed to work harder. <laughs> what, what, um, were you, what were you studying? Uh, I was studying aeronautics and astronautics. And what was your undergrad degree? Uh, physics. Okay. Yeah. And aeronautics and astronautics is basically just Stanford's fancy term for aerospace engineering. Um, the reason I switched from physics to engineering was wanting to do something a little bit more applied. Um, like I, in my undergrad, I studied like special relativity, general relativity and like, you know, like particle physics, quantum mechanics, like, which are really interesting things, but I kind of wanted to do something a little bit more hands-on, which is what ultimately, like, it's kind of weird because I ended up doing a PhD in a relatively like abstract, like computational thing. So, <laughs> so I also kind of went back to that in some way. But, um, but yeah, that's what I, that's what I came here to study. And I definitely, like you asked me about what was the experience going from having a year out to that. Um, <laughs> so I discovered when I came to another thing I discovered when I came to the U S was that I could choose my classes and I could take classes that weren't in my, in aerospace, you know, engineering. So I also took a year's worth of Spanish <laughs> and, uh, and then I, instead of like, you know, most grad students like just keep studying. They don't necessarily take like the, the summer off, like they work through the summer, especially if they're aspiring to do a PhD. Um, but that summer I took it off and I went to South America. So <laughs> <laughs> what, what did your, did you have an advisor at that point in time? At that point in time, uh, yes and no. Um, so I, when I came, like my the initial advisor I sort of like hooked up with um, was doing a lot of satellite design, um, and that's kind of what I that first year I, I did a lot of stuff related to that. Um, and I think partially I was also at the end of that first year I was unsure whether or not I wanted to continue to do a PhD, even though I in, had intended to do that when I started. Um, and I actually ended up switching advisors, um, over that period of time. So, um, from like satellite design to more like computational fluid dynamics. Um, but yeah, I know I like to keep those advisors on their toes by like doing stuff that they don't expect. <laughs> did any, did any aspect of that experience actually stress you out or have you always had like a fairly even bearing because it sounds like you've gone in all these different directions, lots of different adventures. Does, th does all that change and just like the dynamic nature of, of these situations evolving? Do you enjoy that or do you find it to be stressful? I, I think it's sometimes a bit of both. I don't think it's necessarily just one or the other. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I don't really know where home is. So to some extent, 
like sometimes sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad it can be good because it can make it easy for you to go somewhere else um but it you know can be bad because you don't necessarily have um that attachment in some way like i you know like I'm sure we can get into it later, but like I'm, I'm leaving the U S right now. And it's kind of weird. Cause I feel like I've been in California so long that it's home. Um, and it's, it's in some way it's easy to leave because it's still technically legally not my home. Um, but in some way it's a little bit stressful cause it's like, you know, I've been here for a while. So. Yeah, that makes sense. So after, after you went to South America, like on that, on that path, did, were you still holding on to the dream of being an astronaut or like had your ambitions moved in a different direction? Like what were you thinking about where everything was headed? I, I wasn't, yeah, I was like, I think, I think for a lot of time and probably still like I've been kind of searching. So I think I wasn't necessarily not wanting to be an astronaut. Um, but I think trying to find, you know what i can impact where i can like be you know where where i want to be i I don't know so uh i think the realities of like trying to become an astronaut especially when you're not an american citizen are pretty hard um and i think also the the year out that i had kind of a lot changed a lot of my perspectives anyway um and i just wanted to you know, I guess there is an element of wanting to be an astronaut, of wanting to explore. And I think it was maybe part of that that like took me to South America, especially given I'd taken a year of Spanish. So I felt definitely not fluent in Spanish, but, uh, you know, competent. And it, it was very interesting traveling around with an ability to speak the language um, and and see things from a different side of view than like the, the typical gringo. Has learning always come pretty easily to you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's easy. I think it interests me. So, you know, when you're interested in something that can make it easier to some extent, um, that I, I definitely, I know how to, I'm like an annoying person to play at like board games because I, I'm pretty good at like working out what the strategy should be. Um, so with, so from a learning perspective, um, in the UK, so this is how, this is how my, uh, my undergrad, how we did exams. Some of our courses we'd study in the fall and we wouldn't actually have a final exam in that course until June. So it, it, in those contexts, it pr- became pretty apparent that, what you need to do in the fall is take pretty good notes. And then what you need to do like two weeks before the exam is, is to really study. <laughs> <laughs> so like, so like, and it, you know, like in a lot of things, you know, this comes back to diving, this comes back to other things. It's like, how do you, how do you maximize what you get with, with like minimizing the outlay? Um, which isn't necessarily me saying I'm being lazy, but it's like in diving, it's like, how do I, stay down here and have the best experience without breathing too much oxygen. How do I, um, and you know, in studying it's like, and, and, you know, especially like the way that we did, um, exams back then, like I said, that you couldn't, um, you, no one got hundred percent. It was basically about like in this, I have this exam in front of me, like which question should I answer? Like, how do I maximize my score in the exam? So there was, there was a strategic element about doing those. Um, I even remember one exam that we got given a, a handful of um, practice exams from like previous years. And it was the same teacher. And <laughs> I pretty much worked out what the exam would be. Like the numbers would change, but I was like, this question is going to be in there. This question is going to be in there. This question is going to be in there. So it made it very so like if 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 you come at it like that, you can kind of like game these things a little bit. So sometimes with learning, there are ways to like game the system, but that doesn't always necessarily mean you're learning. I don't know. It's I don't know whether that's a great 
Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that completely makes sense. How did that work as it applied to pursuing your PhD or not? Like, did it become a different experience at that point in time? So I think, yeah. So, and, and that's kind of like, I guess I could bring in the, the story of like the difference between like learning Spanish and learning French when I was a kid. When I learned French when I was a kid, it was much more about like passing, you know, quizzes and like tests and, and, you know, getting the right things um, and learning grammar. And when I learned Spanish in the U S it was totally more about conversational. Um, and it, 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 as, as a way of learning a language, like it, it's so much more engaging, like you learn it and you actually use it straight away. Um, and it doesn't, and it, it never mattered so much, uh, when I was learning Spanish, like if you made a mistake, it's okay. Like, did I understand you? Yes. That's the, that's kind of the whole point. Um, and I think I, rem- I do remember on my PhD, like you have to take a certain number of, of required units. Um, and they can be in some of them, there were like specific classes you had to take. And then in some of them, there was just like, you have to have taken certain number of classes. And then there's like a lot of other units, which are just like research credits. Um, and I remember being very done with school <laughs> at some point and being done with being in classes and realizing that like, I don't really need to be in this class except for I just need to get a high enough grade. Um, whereas the research was, you know, totally, that was much more about learning because you're actually trying to figure something out rather than just trying to, you know, get a good enough grade in, in this problem set. And I think it's, it's, I mean, that's a better way to learn and it's a more useful way to learn because like a lot of that other stuff that like you just learn to pass an exam, like when you have other exams coming up later, it's like, well, you don't need to remember that anymore. So like, you know, goodbye. (laughs) How long did you end up being in the PhD program? And, you know, I know things changed a little bit later in terms of where your career went. So like, how long did it take to get the the PhD and like what was what did you think you were going to do like after you completed it? Well, so it was technically a 6-year PhD. But <laughs> with a big gap, um I had a big break. So, uh, a year after basically just after I passed qualifying exams. So, um if anyone hasn't done a PhD or yeah, um, there's anybody out there that that doesn't, doesn't have a PhD from Stanford. that's listening. Um, So like they make you and each department does it a little different, but they make you basically make you pass like a series of exams to admit you to the PhD program. Yep. Um, And the way that Aero Asher did it is they did all of the qualifying exams of everyone over the course of like three days and like you had like your minor exams where you would basically go to like certain professors offices and they had like an hour or however long it was to just ask you questions. And you know, you had to like problem solve in front of them or whatever. It was probably not maybe an hour, but it was a while. And then, um, and then you have your major board where you basically go up in front of like four professors of the specific area that you're hoping to do your PhD in. Um, and you know, you have a whiteboard and they all just like throw questions at you and see if you can survive. (laughs) Um, and that was, that was definitely a a challenging and, and tough experience. I mean, that's like, that's, that's really hard to go through. Um, I mean, it probably similar to like defending your thesis at the end. Um, but then, so I passed qualifying exams and then I couldn't get funding so I actually left Stanford for five years. Um, and that's like I mentioned before that um, I uh, applied to join the army uh, in, in the British army. So that's kind of like where a lot of that, like a lot of my scuba diving, uh, like my more technical scuba diving came in that period. Uh, so I had like a five year period where I was, I was out for a while. I um, was going through like army selection for a while. I actually suffered a, a couple of injuries. Um, so it was kind of, it was a, it was a five year break, which actually again, changed my perspective when I came back because it was when I came back 
that I wanted to finish my PhD, but I also very much wanted to learn new skills and try new things. Um, and literally within like the first week of me being back on campus, I went to the Stanford Daily, which is the student newspaper. I was like, I want to write. <laughs> I'm a grad student. I know grad students don't do that, but um, uh, I want to like contribute. I want to do something. Um, and they had a, they had an opening in sports writing at the time, actually in men's soccer. So I was like, hey, I'm British. <laughs> <laughs> before before um, Tom, before you got to that, how did it yeah. how, did, how did it feel when you had that moment when you're like, you know, you'd come to America, you'd been at Stanford, you'd gone through the qualifying exams, and then you were unable to achieve funding and like you had to pull the plug. Like, how did that feel? I, I was really hard. Yeah, I was. I was. It was, and I'd, I'd, uh, I'd also interviewed for like a job out here as well and i couldn't get that because i didn't have residency um and uh and it was yeah it was it 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 kind of happened pretty quickly that i couldn't get funding um and i think i literally got an email or some communication from uh the uh I don't think it was from my department. It was probably from like the international center at Stanford saying that if you're not registered for classes, you should leave the country. Like you don't want to be out of status in the U S cause that basically puts a red mark on, on your sort of future ability to do stuff here. So their advice was like literally like leave the country in two weeks. Um, so yeah, it was very strange. I actually, <laughs> I went, I left the country and I went to Fiji and went diving for three months. So, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then moved back to the, uh, to Europe. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely odd. Um, I've, I've definitely had a few times like that and it's, uh, it's just a case of like trying to find like what's next and trying to work out like what, do, what do I want to do? rather than like what am i being forced to do because i'm getting kicked out of it so would you quickly move to action I, like in that instance like did you you had to leave the country in two weeks so you kind of were forced to shift into action but just generally when you face kind of crux moments like that do you always move to action or are you ever like stuck in the feeling of like oh man this is a this is a bad situation like how do you problem solve when something like that comes up i think it's difficult. I, I find problem solving for myself a little bit harder than problem solving for other people. Um, uh, I think it's difficult because if there is a clear, obvious action, then like, I think it's easier to move to that. But when there isn't, um, I think it's a little bit harder. Um, and, and, you know, that gets mixed with like, some sadness of having, you know, especially when it's like having to leave a country, it's like, it's, there's some sadness of, Oh, I have to leave really quickly. <laughs> um, I think, I think like, I don't think I can say exactly. Uh, I think it, it varies. How did that impact your sense of self? If at all? Um, well, I didn't really know what I was going to do for a while. <laughs> so, you know, I think we often define ourselves um, by what we do, uh, whether it's what we do um, as a job, as a vocation, or as like pastimes. Um, and I, I definitely felt like, should I, do I go back to the UK and get like an engineering job? Um, and I think that's why, that's partly why I settled in on uh, joining the army I, I felt like you know i'm sure a lot of people because you know this was back in 2004 um i know a lot of people were joining the military around that time because of you know everything that was going on in the world um 9 11 etc um i kind of felt that i wanted to have an impact um and i felt that uh i was kind of looking at the uh 
the um, engineering corps, the Royal Corps of Engineers in the British Army. And they do a lot of, they're not necessarily on the front, li- front line so much, um, but they do a lot of support stuff. And they also do a lot of um, sort of peacekeeping, like rebuilding, things like that. So it seems like a very interesting part of the army to be involved in. Um, and so I think I took, I took some time out, I went to Fiji. Um, and then when I came back and moved to the UK, I started centering on this concept of, of joining the army and, and that kind of like learning about that, figuring that out, um, was probably, you know, like a year or so of the next time. And <clears throat> Pardon me. As you mentioned, you had injuries and it didn't work out. But like when you did enter the training pipeline, I mean that's an incredibly regimented lifestyle relative to. I mean, and I know a PhD program is incredibly rigorous, but you also it sounds like you had a lot of autonomy in terms of how you approach your studies. You took Spanish for a year. You went to South America, right? Uh, was that a bit of a shock to the system, like the time that you spent in that training pipeline or not? Well, so I, I never, like, I basically never quite got into the pipeline. I basically, okay. I injured myself and I had surgery and I'd been approved to start. And like, just before I showed up to start, they were like, no, sorry, you're out. So like, I, I got, I got experience of like being, you know, sitting in with units and, and being around and stuff like that. But I, I was never like formally like in, in actual active training. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was like an interesting question is like, that's going to be a very different experience maybe than the freedom of academia or, or, or whatever. Um, but I felt that, you know, it's not like you're necessarily signing your life away forever. Like, like, uh, an officer, like, um, I think, you know, you, potentially you're only signing up for three years. Um, so it's not, you know, it's like, it's like going to do another degree. <laughs> um, so, and obviously you can stay beyond that, but, um, uh, it's, it's a little easier in terms of life planning, like going to be an officer than necessarily like signing up as, um, a soldier. Right. So that, that didn't work out. You end up back at Stanford and as you mentioned, like very shortly after showing up, things kind of went in a different direction. So can you tell me more about that? And also concurrently, were you continuing with your work on your PhD or like what was going on? Um, right. So I, I guess I, I want to continue a little bit on the army thing to pivot yeah, into for sure. that. Um, one thing I would say is like, one thing I noticed in terms of the army selection is that, you know, I've talked about the being like gaming the system is like, you can totally like, I was amazed to show up to some of these um, like tests or like uh, visits to facilities and stuff. And people didn't know they hadn't done, like they hadn't done enough pushups on their own. They hadn't like practiced these things and worked out how, you know, how you're supposed to do like the 40 or so pushups you're given to do in like the minute or two minutes or whatever, like all of this stuff, you can do like there was a there was a test where you have to um there's an obstacle course and you can basically go around it as many times as you want and you get like i guess you get points for like how many things you go around but one of the things is a a hoop that you dive through right and it's like it's about like the height of a chair or whatever so it's not like crazy high um and and we were actually like you know that was like a, whether or not people went for it was like a thing. And like, I knew that a long time in advance. So like I put a chair in my back garden and what, like every day I would like, like do a forward roll for it. Like, right. I mean, it's, and it's like, I was amazed that like other people hadn't done that. Cause like the, the, there's stuff that, you can't predict in those things, but there's also just so much stuff that you can like have already gamed. So, so like you can, you can be, if you're trying to get into anything, there are definitely ways to like just get an ed, a step up by practicing some of these things. Um, 
Uh, but yeah, so, <laughs> and, and so, and, and another thing, like another thing in the army is, um, one of the tests that they gave us was a writing, was actually a writing test. Um, and the, the officer who like, they like basically someone reviewed them and then they sat you down and they talked them through and like you were given like, I think it was on bird flu. I was given like, you know, an hour to write like an essay on bird flu. Um, I guess bird flu was a bit thing back at that time. No one had heard of like <laughs> coronavirus back then. But um, uh, and I like I did it, and and the officer was actually like I wouldn't say like you know like totally overwhelmed, like un unbelieving that I wrote so well or whatever. But was like I, I think he was very impressed by the writing. Um, and I think it it triggered in me an interest in like, well, can I write? Can I actually write for other people? Because like you know, anyone anyone out there, if you write something, hopefully, and you give it to your mom, she's going to be like, oh, that's great. <laughs> this is the best writing I've ever read. Like that's what parents are supposed to do. Um, uh, but there's a difference between writing something and having someone else read it. Um, and that was, I think, one of the things I wanted to find out when I came back to Stanford um, was like, well, what's it actually like to write to a deadline and have like potentially thousands of people read what you write? Um, and literally, like the only real way to do that is to go to a <laughs> like a newspaper and start writing, right? When you handed that uh, to the the officer that piece of writing and, and saw the reaction, was that any different than, you know, turning in uh, a, te like a test with math problems or physics problems and getting a reaction? Like, did you get a different, I, cause I know what you're talking about, right? But like, what was yeah. that, what was that, was that feeling different than something you'd experienced before? I, I think it's, there's a difference between writing and like doing a physics or math problem because there's definitely an answer to a physics or math problem. Like, and there are different ways that you can derive and get to the answer. And so, you know, you may get graded on those, but like, you know, whether or not you got the right answer. Yeah. Um, and, and this, like this, like essay thing was actually kind of, to some extent it was, you know, connected to how journalism works because you had a limited period of time. You have to write a coherent essay. You didn't have time to like, you know, it wasn't on a computer. It was all by hand. You didn't have time to um, edit stuff and move stuff around and like review it and, and stuff like that. You just had to go, just like go. So, um, it and and you know, there isn't there isn't a fixed answer. There's obviously better essays and worse essays, um, but there's some subjectiveness and there's some like choices that you have to make to do that. So it's it's definitely you know, obviously those are much harder to grade because there isn't a correct answer. Um, but as a challenge, it's, it's just very different to, um, yeah, like a physics or math problem. So when you got back to Stanford, that was part of what led you to. Go yeah. On, go in a I different just, direction. I just wanted to, I just wanted to like try. And I, I think I wanted to try a few different things and, um, it felt like I'd, I'd read the Stanford daily. Most of these do the crossword, um, when I was there before. And I was just like, Oh, you know, I wonder, I wonder if I, I'd like to try this and see what it's like. Um, and I actually envisioned that I'd go and write like hard news and do that. It wasn't, I w hadn't necessarily thought that I'd do any sports writing for them. Um, but that was kind of an opportunity they had right then. So that's kind of where I, where I started. And I ended up, spending a lot of time in the daily building, like a lot of time there um, over the course of my PhD. So um, I'm running a ton of stuff and sitting in a lot of sports and it, it, um, it definitely changed my path. What did you like about it? Um, I think one thing that was cool was, you know, as a grad student, like grad students and undergrads 
at Stanford generally don't mix much. So, um, you know, understandably, they have different classes and they have different social sets. But, like, this was something that, like, yeah, they knew I was a grad student. But um, I, w- I was, like, I was kind of accepted as just another staff member. Um, and, you know, we weren't really – I wasn't getting paid because um, I couldn't get paid. Um, but no one else was actually really getting paid. I mean, like, they were – paid like a nominal like salary but it was like they were paid you know twenty dollars for the two hours they worked that week whereas actually they probably worked like 30 hours or whatever (laughs) um but uh it it was it was it was fun to be part of something it was fun to be part of like this editorial process of like putting out a, a newspaper each day and there were deadlines and it was it was just very different from I'd never written like on a student newspaper or anything like that before. So it was, it was a very different experience. Um, and it was kind of like, you know, it's honestly like if, if you go to school and study journalism, like that's, that's like a class, that should be a class, you know, that should be what you do. And how did you gravitate to sports writing? Well, partially because like I, I went and they had like an open thing of, of like these opportunities. Um, and the, the key opportunity they had at the time was like men's soccer. And I thought like, you know, that's a way to get my foot in the door at the, at the daily. So, um, I was like, Oh, I know about soccer. <laughs> I'm British. I know that. Um, so I did that. And then, um, which is fun, but it was also kind of like interesting, because because when I'd first been at Stanford, I honestly hadn't been that interested in Stanford sports. Like I think I went to one football game. I actually went to one like Stanford Cal like big game football game, and uh, I showed up without thinking about it, wearing blue and gold or blue and yellow. Like it was just I had a T-shirt that was blue and yellow. I didn't even think about it, and like immediately my friends made me go and buy a Stanford shirt. Um, that's how little I knew about football back then, and then. Uh, and then when I came back, um, the experience of like, well, so what I was going to say was, it was interesting. I remember walking to a, a men's soccer game one day and I walked past uh, Maples Pavilion, which is where the, they play basketball, but it's also where they play volleyball. And there was like a crowd of people going in to watch a women's volleyball game. And I got to the men's soccer game. There's no one there. And it was, you know, it's like an interesting thing. So it's like, this is like, not how it would be in the UK. Like it's, it's a totally different, um, experience. Um, and you know, it was fun to cover men's soccer, but it was a pretty small beat. It wasn't like hugely important. And then I, there was an opening for uh, covering women's basketball. Um, the, you know, just after the men's soccer season was ending. So I, I knew that women's basketball was pretty big at Stanford, relatively big. I knew that we'd, we'd done pretty well. So I ended up switching to that and, and that was a much different experience. Like the crowds were still not as big as they should have been for like a program that was like very good. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm sitting next to like writers from the AP writers from ESPN. Like it was, um, you know, they actually had like real media conferences. Um, it was, you know, I went to a few, uh, like, um, NCAA tournament games. So I, I, I basically ended up writing women's basketball for the rest of the time I was kind of at Stanford. What was it like the first time you saw your byline, like in the paper? I mean, it's definitely cool. Like, cause it's your, it's, Oh, it's my name. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, it's cool to see cause you don't, when you write, something and send it off especially early because like and initially i'm just like a writer and like no one like i don't i didn't really go to the office early on i just wrote stuff and send it in um so you have no real concept of what the final product is going to look like um later on i you know i ended up editing i would be in the office more so you'd have i wouldn't say you wouldn't have editorial control but you'd just like you'd see the paper getting put together so you'd you'd see like how things were gonna look um but yeah no it's it's definitely i mean like writers love their bylines um 
it's <laughs> it's cool to see it's cool to see it um you know and it makes it that much more real but then you then you get like people like complain about you so because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i was i i did some uh like I did some column writing as well. I ended up writing like a sports column for quite a while. Um, and I, <laughs> I think the one that caused the most, uh, disagreement. And I think possibly almost didn't get published. Um, was my column that was titled college football takes too long, <laughs> oh, boy. which, like, which, so, like, I think, like, to some extent, the people that complain about it, I, I would say, missed my point, which was that um, it was basically there was a game between Stanford and Oregon. And, you know, at the time, both were, you know, I think in the running for, like, you know, both were maybe undefeated. Both had, like, these huge opportunities. Um, and I went and watched it as a fan. You know, it was at Stanford and, like, like Oregon just destroyed us. So like, you know, it's like the beginning of the second quarter and this game's over. Right. And so, so the point, the kind of point was, is like when you're out of it, like suddenly these media timeouts, all this stuff, it's, it's really hard. Like it's really hard to, and I stayed to the end, but it's just like, it's it suddenly when you're losing, like it's, it's really and and you're losing and there's no chance. You know there's no chance. Barring like some insane, barring like you know what the Patriots Eagles kind of like come back, like it's it's done and you just have to sit there and like watch the Oregon fans having a great time for like two hours. <laughs> Was it addictive once you got into it? I think so, um, and I think again I said like um, you know one of the things is like being more around the undergrads. Um, and I ended up with a lot of friends who are, who were undergrads then. Um, and you know, they're much more connected to the school in some way than I think the grad students are. You know, most right. grad students have their, you know, undergrad school. And, you know, if they went to school in America, they probably have, you know, their undergrad school that has a great football team that they support or an okay football team or a football team. Um, or a basketball team. So like, you know, they're less like, it's great that they're going to Stanford, but it's not like this is the school that they root for. Um, whereas in the UK sports just isn't a big thing at college. Um, like honestly, the best players in sports in the UK are already playing for like, <laughs> like pro teams. They don't go to college. Um, so, you know, Stanford to some extent was my undergrad sports school um from that point onwards so it was it was yeah i i mean i, I think that was one might have been my last year i went to like stanford play like 14 football games and i went to 12 of them so like which means traveling <laughs> quite a lot um so it was it was very addictive to kind of be be part of that experience for a while so it sounds like community was like a big part of what you enjoyed about it, like both the camaraderie and community of like being on the staff of the paper as well as connecting yeah. more to the place where you were versus being in like a cloistered academic kind of vibe, right? right? When, when yeah. did it become something that you were like, you know what, like this is what I'm going to do for a living. This is actually going to be my career now. So I, I, the, the year before I graduated, um, uh, was the summer of 2012. And I, like a year or two before that, I'd put in my name to volunteer for the London Olympics. Cause I was like, I know the Olympics don't happen that often in your own country. So like, I want to be part of this in some way. Um, I know I'm not competing, but I want to be part of this. And I just put my name in as a volunteer and I was, Lucky enough, I think possibly because I had some media experience by that point, even though it was, you know, a student newspaper, I got picked to, uh, as a, a flash quote reporter, which is, um, someone that basically interviews the athletes right after competition. Um, and was randomly assigned to beach volleyball, which like I knew nothing about. And everyone's like, Oh, it's just the, you know, women wearing like, <laughs> like bathing suits, whatever. 
Um, but uh, I, I, and I don't, I'm sure it would have been really cool to be part of the Olympic stadium, um, be a flash group reporter there and see like all the sort of bigger high profile sports. Um, but the beach volleyball experience was actually super fun because the main Olympic stadium wasn't really in what most people would consider London. Whereas the beach volleyball stadium was a temporary stadium they built in Horse Guards Parade, which is like you have Buckingham Palace on one side, you have the Houses of Parliament on the other side. It's like it's literally, you know, you could stand at the top of the stadium and see every famous site in London. Um, it was and it was super intense. Um, I knew really nothing about beach volleyball when I started. And because we were because we were there every single day um, and I actually ended up just coming in on days when I wasn't supposed to be working and like helping out um, because we were there like every single day watching literally almost like every single game over the course of the two week tournament, the people who were like these flash girl reporters, we became experts <laughs> like real experts in, in this, in this tournament. Um, and that, like right at the end, you know, when, the real journalists actually finally show up for like the gold medal games. Like it was interesting because like we have this like depth of knowledge that they just weren't even close to. Um, and it was, I know it was, it was a fun little uh, team to be part of. Um, I remember playing, uh, going out on, on the court and playing after the gold medal match <laughs> um, at night and, um, and uh, I think it was, you know, we were providing quotes that the uh, that were given out to media. It was like the Olympic wire service kind of thing. Um, and, you know, I think that experience was just, uh, you know, outside of the Stanford Daily. And it was just like, do, like, do I enjoy this? And do I want to continue doing this? Um, and it was, and so when I came back to Stanford, uh, I started applying to journalism programs, um, which which kind of adds some finality or some uh, date to the end of your PhD. Because whenever you do a PhD, if you ever do a PhD, people will always ask you, how much longer are you going to be doing your PhD? Like, when are you graduating? Um, and for a lot of the time, no one really has an idea. There's no, like, in the US, there's, there's no, like, fixed number of years. Like there's like, you know, I know people that have done them for over a decade. Um, like the fact that I technically graduated my degree in like six years, even though there was a gap in there, um, is actually pretty quick. Um, but, uh, once I, once I'd set, <laughs> once I'd set, I started applying to journalism school, I knew that like, I have to be done like in this period of time. Um, so that kind of like adds some focus to that um and uh and the reason i went to journalism school wasn't necessarily that it's required to become a journalist um but actually it was because i could transfer i could finish my phd and transfer my visa <laughs> to <laughs> to journalism school and then that would allow me to then after leaving journalism school to work as a journalist in the UK, in the U S for at least a year without necessarily having to get a new visa. So, so it's about gaming the system. Yeah. It's just, it's just like <laughs> mind blowing that someone is as educated and talented as you has to go through all these hoops to stay in the United <laughs> States. It's like, it's like mind blowing. <laughs> I, I mean, at that point in time, like one thing that's occurring to me is how you, with what you were doing and your background, how did you never get roped into tech? Um, like in terms of like, like aerospace engineering tech or what a background in, in physics and math. Like I just know so many people, I mean, you know, like not pursuing aerospace engineering necessarily, but people who have really deep backgrounds on the quant side, they always seem to get roped into random areas of tech. I don't know. Right. Right, I, like I'm sure you have a lot of friends who just randomly, like, oh yeah, like they're now doing something for some big tech company or small tech company or writing algorithms or whatever. Right. Um, I think partially that, like, 
maybe I didn't have the right connections or I just wasn't looking for that. Um, and like I went, so I did journalism school in, in New York, um, and at Columbia and, uh, then ended up working at Sports Illustrated for a little bit of time. And like when I was in New York, I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm sure New York will disagree, but like the tech there is like, it's not, it just didn't feel like a tech hotbed to me. Um, like I remember journalism school being so amazed at their lack of tech savvy and and maybe i would have found that at stanford but i just don't feel that was the case um and so i know it it was it was definitely i think i think in some contexts journalism is pretty backwards with tech which is kind of amazing um you know and there are definitely some publications that are more on top of it um, but it, it, it was almost like going from a much more high tech world to a, a pretty low tech world. Right. And, and then once you fully like were doing this professionally, like what have been your favorite experiences or your favorite pieces that you've created? Um, I think like overall my favorite stuff is is like the smaller sports or the people like you don't otherwise hear about um the like you know i remember like covering like adaptive athletes like you know like paralympic athletes um and like they have stories every bit as interesting as like your nfl quarterback you know, way more to some extent, because not, not only, you know, is there a disability, but anyone, anyone who's doing a sport that's not high profile probably has to balance a lot of stuff to do that sport. And so the desire to do that sport is pretty significant. Like that person is really in this, um, you know, and yes, there are certain to be some like quarterback, you know, NFL players or like basketball players who are, have the similar mindset, but it's not necessary a requirement, I think, to be um, those those players. Um, and so, like, I I remember, you know, I remember writing a piece about uh, Paralympic sport, which was kind of focused on um, this concept of like not not looking at people with disabilities, but looking at people from a focus of ability um which is actually how classification is done in the paralympics um they they actually pre-classify people according to their disability so they pre-classify people according to their medical problem um but then they'll reclassify people uh according to actually what their ability is because you can have the, the whole concept of their different like classification system is to create a level playing field for people to compete. And some people may appear medically to be, have this restriction, but actually when you actually see them compete, either they're, they're sort of higher up or they're lower down in, in that classification system. Um, and, and, you know, that, that kind of, that connected to something that I was reading when I was working on this that talked about, they might not have the terminology right, but this concept that there's like two ways to look at disability. There's the kind of like medical way to look at disability, which is saying that like this person is, you know, missing a leg and therefore like has these restrictions and can't do these things, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's the like society societal way to look at disability, which is like, you know, this person is like uh, the, that is like society or the rules that we have or whatever need to be adjusted so that that disability isn't a disability. Um, and I, I remember noticing that when during this, cause I, I, I got talking to, uh, a woman who uh, was is one of the uh, uh, sitting volleyball players on the uh, the U.S. team, and she invited me to come play sitting volleyball, um, which is basically you sit on the ground, um, 
So it's uh, you know for people with you know missing legs and and, and with right. uh, any sort of disabilities like that, um, and you sit on the ground and you know the net is a little bit higher, lower and and you basically play volleyball that way. Um, and I got to play that, and I also got to play wheelchair rugby, which is intense. <laughs> if you've ever like seen it or played it, or whatever. And I remember in sitting volleyball, you know, the experience of while I'm playing this, I'm like a substandard, not very good at this. Like these people are crushing me. Like I, I can't even get to the balls that they're hitting. And they're like, and they're always like getting to the you know returns that I hit. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, game, like I stand up and like I return to the real world. And it was the same in um, wheelchair rugby. Whereas during the game, there really was no difference. Like I was, I was, you know, there was, I had no advantage over people. Um, but at the end of it, I sit out, up out of the chair. I, I even remember, you know, coming into that and I, I sit in this chair and it was like, it's a super narrow chair because it's not really made for someone that doesn't have, um, like, because people with like these sort of spinal injuries, like lose a lot of like function in their lower legs. So like the, the hips are sort of much more compressed or whatever. Um, but so it's not a comfortable chair. <laughs> But I remember sitting in this chair and this game starting and um, there, there are two types of chairs in sitting rugby. There's a defensive chair and an offensive chair. Um, and the, uh, like the defensive chairs, I think, I think it's the defensive chairs. They have like, I don't know what the best way to describe this, almost like spikes that are made to jam into the wheels <laughs> of the attacking chairs to like lock them and stop them moving. So you like ram some of them basically. Um, and I remember like starting this game and thinking like, well, you know, these people have disabilities and you know, like I, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to like knock anyone over or anything like that. And like, you know, a fraction of a second into this game, someone just slams into me so hard and they are like, Oh, Oh, this got real. Not like I, it's not like I need to be nice to them. It's like I have to defend myself out here. <laughs> I'm going to get injured if I am not aggressive. <laughs> um, and it was just really interesting that experience of of um, seeing that if we if we change the rules of society, a lot of these things that we consider to be disabilities just go away they don't like they don't restrict people um it's just you know and it's obviously easier in sports so like in some sports to like change the rules of the game but like you know it's like w why wouldn't a building have a ramp like of course it would have a ramp like the, the it not having a ramp totally suddenly it just like cuts out like anyone who's in a wheelchair um and and you know like ways that you could people who are like visually impaired like why would you not like find ways to kind of like extend that for them. So um, that, that experience was really, really cool. Um, I remember I, I was lucky enough to go to Laos uh, with uh, Rebecca Rush, who's, I know she's been on your show before. She's a, become a good friend. Um, and she's like, I randomly met her. Um, she was going to talk at the place when I lived in New York, that I would keep my bike when I went to work. Um, and I kind of randomly met her through that. And like, honestly, she's probably the person that like I had a bike at the time, but she's the person that inspired me to like really start riding a bike and, and, and do more things. Um, and, and yeah, like a few years ago, she invited me to come ride, uh, part of the Ho Chi Minh trail that she'd already ridden, um, with a group of, uh, other people who were going. And, uh, I wrote a story about that and it was just, um, I don't know it was amazing to see those places and really experience how that how bad that war had it been i mean there was one period where you're you're, you're riding through a trail through the jungle you know it's like a road and you see all these like beautiful uh like ponds everywhere or these little round ponds, like the villages, you'll uh, have a little round pond. And, and then you start to like, it's almost like someone then points out to you that 
oh, those are bomb craters. And then suddenly, like, the realness of that um, comes through. So I think to some extent, I don't know whether this is really answering your question, but I think to some extent, the stories that I've most enjoyed are the ones that, like, I really learned something new. Like, there's a real experience element to it. Um, that's kind of the one of the benefits of being a journalist. I don't know if, if you kind of have, have share the same concept from your writing, but is to experience and to learn yourself. And then you have to find a way to like transcribe that to someone else and like help someone else understand what you experienced. But yeah, absolutely. That completely resonates with me. And I mean, that's part of why I started this podcast because I really missed that aspect of, of being a journalist. And I also found, you know, when I was active as a journalist for over a decade that I, I had a lot of transformative experiences and really powerful experiences like what you just described with adaptive athletes, lots of things like that. And, you know, then there's what you actually have to write on deadline for a publication that needs a certain thing. Right. And often like the magnitude of your experience or the transformation that that you might have had or that you know is possible to tell the story about simply does not fit in the commercial work product that you have to produce. And personally, I've, I found that to be pretty frustrating. Um, you know, at the same time, like I wouldn't have had those experiences, which I consider to be a privilege had I not had the commercial side of what I was doing. And that's also part of why I wanted to do this podcast and have people like you on because your writing is amazing. You're an incredible person. And also, I know you've had all of these experiences beyond the scope of the stories people may have seen attached to your byline. And I think it's really interesting to learn a little bit more about the stories behind the stories. And I mean, in that regard, I'm, I'm really curious, like now that you've spent so much time in this domain of sport, what is it about sport that you think is like so important or powerful? Like why is it such an important thing within the context of our culture or for us as individuals? Well, so, I mean, and this gets to kind of like, I think the commercialization issue, which is the, you know, like I, I have written some stories related to like NFL and stuff like that, but I think sometimes this, this pressure to produce the best commercial piece takes us away from like the best or like the most impactful stories that we could tell. Um, like, you know, I'm sure if anyone has a chance to like write a profile on Tom Brady, they're probably going to do it. But like, we've done that. Like, like I'm sure that not, not much has changed since the last one that was written about him. But unfortunately that is one that will get read a lot and therefore is, is one that is, is prioritized. But, um, I think, I think sports to some extent, like, and this is kind of like coming from a sports journalism background is kind of a little bit lost its way. Um, I think it can be hugely inspiring. Like the, the ability to see, you know, humankind achieve things, uh, that seem, you know, unachievable, um, or, or just, just to see, um, achievement, is 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 truly inspiring but i think sometimes that gets lost in just the need to like play games the need to um to win sometimes <laughs> like i so something i've been doing for the last couple of years is coaching rowing um so i also ended up becoming a rower and i think it's so and it, coaching high school rowing and I think it's so easy to see there's a lot of pressures put on these kids like college scholarships. Um, you know, it's like, Oh, you have to win your first race. You have to like do all these things. And I, I, I worry that suddenly these sports aren't becoming fun. Like you see so many, there are so many college athletes who quit after one or two years. Like they spent their entire childhood playing this sport and they quit after one or two years in college. Like, I'm like, is something wrong here? Because like, if they really love that sport, 
like it, you know, it, there should be, they should, it, it should be really hard for them to quit. They, they should want to like, or they should, they'll quit, but they're actually still playing club or, you know, all these things. And I think, honestly, I think <laughs> like I, I've been kind of critical of the, uh, the sports world this past year. Um, because I think this past year has exposed a lot of misplaced, um, priorities and like i don't think the nfl should be playing right now i don't think like i think a lot of the biggest sports teams instead of playing their season should have been doing something proactive to solve this kind of pandemic that's going on or or to you know engage with all those kids who are stuck at home and like some don't even have good wi-fi don't like it's they're struggling to do school like like this was like the opportunity for the pro sports world to be like, well, actually it's not all about sports. Like we'll, we'll make our money next year. Like, and we can make a lot of fans this year by just being good humans. And I think, I think sports has kind of lost its ability to, to be fun to some extent. Um, and I, like as someone who's spent a lot of time in sports, like, that kind of worries me. Um, I, I don't necessarily have the answer, um, but I think that, yeah, I can't even remember what the question was, but, but I think that, I think that, and to me, that's also like a similar thing. It's like, do I want to keep writing about sports right now? Because I, it, it feels, it feels a little irrelevant. But as a practitioner of sport yourself and as a coach, what meaning does sport continue to have for you just like as an individual or like, what do you, what do right. you, see, right? I, yeah. So I think like on an individual le level, it's hugely empowering. Like it's a, you know, we've been like for a lot of this year, people have been stuck inside. It's this ability to be outside, to be in nature, to like understand and be at like one with who you are, um, to like, you know, when I go on bike rides, I turn my phone off. Um, I do have a bike computer, so like it will give me some data or whatever. But like a lot of it, it's just like to eat some more. Do I like you know how hard can I go? Like you know, like riding down the coast road, it was so beautiful um, to 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 see this stuff and be out there alone. Um, and I think it's it's a way for us to step away from the rest of the world and, and be in this like space that, you know, we can be with, with friends or whatever, but it's just, I wouldn't say it's a distraction. It's, it's, it's just, it's almost like sometimes like a more real place to be. Cause like, honestly, like, you know, being out on a bike ride on the coast road feels way more real than like being on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, completely. And I don't know what your experience has been, but you know, as, as someone who's gone deeper and deeper and deeper into cycling over the course of my life. And I was always into it when I was a kid. I, I, I don't feel that I particularly, you know, this is like a fixed mindset, but just as a kid, I was the youngest kid in my class. I was small. I was always slow you know, I, I remember reading like bicycling magazine and looking at training programs and seeing like, you know, oh, if you want to race, like you need to like go on a three hour ride on Wednesday or whatever. I was like, I could never go on a three hour ride. Like the idea of going on a hundred mile bike ride when I was like 12 or 13 was just, I was just like, that's just not possible. But as an adult, I've gone deeper and deeper and deeper, you know, to the point of like messing up my heart and, and a lot of other things, uh, maybe a little bit too deep, but you know, I think one of the most important things that's taught me is like that I, I can do more than I think is possible. And like, I can go deeper than maybe I thought I could. And again, like you don't necessarily want to like keep going back to that well too many times because there are limits, but there is something about sport that's like very transformative and that can open up new dimensions of how you perceive yourself and in turn, how you perceive other people or connect to other people. So, yeah, I mean, like what you're sharing really resonates with me and I'm, I'm sure it resonates with the kind of people who tune into this 
into the show. So, I mean, as you think about what's next for you, like you're at kind of like another crux moment. I don't know if you're going to, I don't know if you're going to go scuba diving like five minutes after we get off this call in Fiji or <laughs> what the plan is. But as you said, like you're on your way out of the country pretty soon. It sounds like, like, what do you, what's next for you? Where do you want to go? Uh, so right now, uh, I'm planning to fly to Madrid. That's a very literal uh, answer, yeah. Tom. <laughs> no, no I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting that. Um, in, in part because like the world is so confusing right now and it's hard to know like, like what the political situation, what the coronavirus situation is anywhere. Um, and basically I realized that there's a window that if I wanted to like get residency in Spain as a citizen, I, there's actually still a window I can do that. So I was like, hmm, wonder, wonder, I speak Spanish and I lived in Spain for a little bit. So it's kind of like, maybe, maybe this is a time to try and see what that's like. Um, so I bought a ticket to Madrid and then I'm going to, get a rental car and then where, where am I going to live? <laughs> so it's not um, it, like literally like right now the, the plan is that I have a ticket to Madrid. Um, and then where I go from there, I don't know. I think I, I want to do something that's impactful. Um, I do really enjoy storytelling. I just don't know how to do that. I have, or, or like what the what the exact like role that might be. Um, I do I do have some ideas for books that I'm I've kind of started working on. I have like this awesome. Uh, there's a, a Paralympian I know. He's technically not a Paralympian yet because he's never competed at the Paralympics. But he's a rower. He's uh, a guy that um, maybe I should connect him to you. He's. Uh, he was born with um, various disabilities, uh, yet managed to kind of cheat his way into the army, <laughs> and then ended up in the navy. Went to SEAL training. Um, like has never really like he's he's achieved far more than most people that don't have like actual like physical disabilities, um, and is now basically trying to like qualify. Well, he he qualified a U.S. boat for the Olympic, uh, for the Paralympics in Tokyo. Um, he just needs to win trials to ensure that he's in that boat. Um, and I think there's, there's just, a, there are some really interesting characters in that. And I think it's also, so I think that's a story that I just want to f know more about. Um, and I think possibly there's, uh, like a story or a book in that, um, uh, so the, there are some things like that. I would, I know I would love to be in a situation where I could in, innovate more within journalism, which I think is, I think like, I personally think journalism just doesn't have that much innovation in it. Um, I think most uh, like a lot of, a lot of publications, their websites aren't really different to what would be in print. And I think, um, like I've, I've talked before about like, why, why aren't there choose your own adventure news stories, which is kind of the way that we, we explore the internet. We literally, we go from one site and we follow links and we, we move around. Whereas when you read like a story about a game, like it's like, it starts at the top and you go to the bottom and, that's it. But like you, you actually, you know, I'm sure from your, you know, reporting, you have experienced this. Like there's a lot of stuff that doesn't go in there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> a like, lot of are, stuff that doesn't go there in are, there. Yeah. And, and there are great stories. There's like, you know, there'll be like a paragraph or a couple paragraphs. You're, you're like, I really want this in there because it's such a cool anecdote, but it just doesn't fit. And eventually you have to cut it. Um, and so like, why can't you have like, why can't you create something in such a way that all of that can fit in there, but like there's like different ways through the story. Um, so I'd love to try doing some of that. Um, I have some tech skills, so like that's something I, I can 
potentially start playing around with. Um, but, you know, to some extent, there's a reality of like, I need somewhere to live <laughs> and I need some money to live with. So, Well, as long as you have bikes with you, I think you'll be in good shape. How many bikes are going on this trip? I'm only taking one bike. I'm, I'm traveling pretty light. I'm leaving uh, my mountain bike here. Uh, I got rid of, I'm getting rid of like, I have like a couple of fixies, um, the one I already was kind of broken. I donated, um, the other one I'll probably donate. And then I have my road gravel bike and my mountain bike. So my mountain bike's probably going to stay here for now. Um, just cause it's definitely the bike I use less. Um, and I'll bring the road bike, road or gravel bike, whatever you want to classify it as. So, so you'll have wheels. I'll have wheels. Yeah. I mean, that bike's now got like. 14,000 miles on, so... Yeah, it's, bro- it's like broken it's, in. It's probably the one I use most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I like... I, I... When I was on crutches, you know, it's so weird. Uh, earlier this year, it's it's just... It's so weird not riding a bike. I've, I've ridden... Over the last few years, I've ridden... Like, there's so many days where I've ridden a bike even at least once a day. Like, and it's just... There's... I don't think as a kid, like I rode bikes enough to have this experience, but it just feels so natural to be on a bike. It, it like, it's amazing. So like to go, like, even if I'm traveling with you in the U S I'm always like thinking like, I know I'm only going there for two days, but like, can I bring a bike with me? <laughs> <laughs> like, I like, I, I'm always like looking on online to see if there's like good foldable bikes. Because, like, I don't want, like, the ones with, like, the tiny little wheels. I'm like, if I want a foldable bike, it's got to have, like, real-sized wheels. Right. You're not a Brompton <laughs> person then. Yeah. No. I'm yeah. Like, I want an actual bike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom, wishing you a lot of success with this next fork in the road. And if people want to be in touch with you or follow you, where can they find you? Uh, so, I have a, a Twitter account, Daily Tom Taylor. Um uh, that I don't use that much, but I'll probably start using it a little bit more. Um, I also like dailytomtaylor.com is my website, which just has some older stories that I've written up there. Um, and I think like if you go through the contact there, you can even find a way to actually reach out to me if you want to say hi. And I think uh, LinkedIn is probably Daily Tom Taylor as well. Awesome. I've kind of like, like Daily Tom Taylor almost always comes to me. So. <laughs> You're owning that Daily Tom Taylor brand. Well, Daily Tom yeah. Taylor, thanks again for your time. Awesome to get to catch up. I always enjoy talking to you, and I knew that there were many more stories beneath the surface, and in fact, it turns out they might have been 10 leagues under the sea. <laughs> so good to chat, man, and good luck on the next phase of your journey. Awesome. Thank you so much. If you have questions, comments, feedback, or want to suggest a guest, please reach out to at Hardway Pod on social or email me at choosethehardway at gmail.com. I've had times in my life when I've been in hot pursuit of my dreams and gave up when I hit obstacles I didn't think I could overcome. After more than two decades working with the world's top performers, I've learned that to be the best in the world or just find your own personal best, you have to choose the hard way. There aren't shortcuts or hacks that will get you there. And you're going to fail over and over and over along the way. Through Choose the Hard Way, I hope to empower more people to reach beyond who they think they are and just keep going, no matter what they encounter in life, so that they can reach their goals and dreams. You can help me make it happen when you take a moment to subscribe to Choose the Hard Way, leave a review and rate the show on iTunes or wherever you listen. It only takes 30 seconds. I truly appreciate it. And so will the people who you help to find the show. You can also sign up for the Choose the Hard Way newsletter to get more information about episodes, guests, and other awesome things when you go to choosethehardway.com slash newsletter. You are what you overcome. Choose the hard way.